is uh, a pleasure to welcome you to our first uh, half in-person, half on Zoom audience and with a virtual speaker, uh, Jack Harris, who's uh, in Connecticut presently, but welcome him to the department. It's real pleasure to welcome Jack is a professor of physics and applied physics at Yale University and a member of the Yale Quantum Institute. Uh, he received his undergrad degree at Cornell and his PhD uh, from UC Santa Barbara, where he was developing ultra-sensitive uh, micromechanical sensors uh, to study quantum Hall effects in the group of uh, David Oshalom. He then moved on to a, a postdoctoral work at the Harvard MIT Center for Ultra Cold Atoms, working with John Doyle and Wolfgang Ketterle uh, on cryogenic atom trapping experiments. He joined the Yale faculty in 2004. Uh, where his group has been working on uh, novel approaches to quantum optomechanics. Um, and in particular, his work is focused on quantum aspects of motion in macroscopic objects, uh, combining mechanical, optical, and superfluid, uh, superfluid helium elements. Um, his, his group works uh, primarily using ultra-sensitive force detectors to measure quantum fluctuations of macroscopic objects. And more recently, he's moved into uh, studies on uh, experimental studies on non-Hermitian systems, uh, the likes of which has grown out of some of our, our, our own Carl Bender's work. So uh, with that, I'll uh, let Jack take over and uh, look forward to hearing this talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so can you see my laser pointer, the red dot moving around? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. So uh, first of all, thank you, Eric, for the introduction, for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking at or to uh, the physics department at Wustel for a couple of reasons. It's been a pleasure interacting over the years with folks like uh, Akater Murch and Lan Yang and Sahin Ozdemir. Um, and it's also a pleasure to be talking about a, a, you know, a small corner of a field that really had its birth at Wustel with the work of Carl Bender and others. Um, so uh, today I'm gonna be telling you about um, a small fragment of what we think of, uh, what we sometimes refer to as non-Hermitian physics. I'm not sure this is necessarily the best term to encompass everything that the field is about now, but it's it's the term that we have. So I'm gonna begin by uh, giving a really, a very pedagogical introduction um, to the part of the field that I'll be talking about and to the specific questions that I'll be trying to address in my talk. This is really, um, not intended to be a talk for specialists, but a talk for, for students and people who are new to the field, uh, as well as folks who know it. Um, I'll uh, try to define what I mean by Hermitian and non-Hermitian systems. I'll try to be clear about whether I'm talking about quantum mechanics or classical mechanics. Spoiler alert, I'm going to be talking about classical mechanics. Um, and then I'll focus on the particular topic that we're interested in, which is understanding topological features in the eigenvalue spectrum of really very simple systems, very simple objects. These are just sort of small square matrices. Um, but I will uh, talk about uh, a nice way to think about um, these matrices as a collection, as a body, as a family of objects, and specifically nice ways of thinking about them when really all we care about is their eigenvalues, is just their spectrum. And once we have this picture uh, in place, I'll talk about how it is that braids and knots, these interesting mathematical objects, emerge not as like some sort of special case or some exotic uh, phenomena, but as an absolutely generic uh, feature in as familiar a system as just the coupled classical oscillators. And at the very end, this may come surprisingly late in, in my talk, I will describe actual experiments in which we realize this in a particular kind of system. But again, my talk is really about coupled oscillators in absolute generality. And I have to say, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be talking at Wustel. Uh, my one regret is this is the very first time uh, I will be presenting any of this work. So uh, I apologize in advance for apparent disorganization. I also wanna start by saying this is a very close collaboration between my own group uh, where we're experimentalists. Uh, and I wanna thank the students and postdoc uh, who have made this experiment possible. But it's a very close collaboration between our group and the theoretical group of Nick Reed at Yale, uh, where that group consists of Nick and his former student, uh, Judith Huller, who's now a postdoc uh, at Genalia. But uh, this is really a combined effort. And I should say, I've learned a tremendous amount from talking to these two uh, folks, uh, but that's no guarantee that I'm going to uh, 
phrase my newfound knowledge correctly. So let me just take credit for errors of fact and judgment at this point. Uh, okay, so uh, let me begin uh, where I said we would start, which is sort of a definition of terms and, and a statement of, of what we're after here. Everything that I'm gonna be talking about today is in relationship to this equation, this differential equation. And at this point, I don't wanna assign any physical meaning or interpretation to this equation. Let's just regard it as a mathematical equation, which describes a relationship between a complex and dimensional vector X, whose time evolution is generated by a matrix H. It's just a garden variety square N by N complex matrix, by which I just mean a matrix populated by complex numbers. And maybe at some point we might imagine that this Hamiltonian will depend on time. We might imagine that it's gonna depend, uh, really in my talk, I'm gonna be focusing on the case in which we just imagine it depending on some parameters. Uh, if you like, these are the matrix elements of this matrix that we might imagine vary. But that's it, that's all I'm gonna be talking about. Finite dimensional matrices, two by two, three by three, and uh, the system described in this way. Now, this is an equation that we encounter in a lot of settings in the physical sciences. Some of its popular applications, of course, would be to regard this equation as the Schrodinger equation for a quantum mechanical n-level system closed, you know, uh, not open to any environment, just textbook isolated n-level quantum system, in which case this would be, as I said, the Schrodinger equation. This is also mathematically equivalent to Newton's laws written to describe uh, the motion of coupled harmonic oscillators. This equation is also found in a more sophisticated treatments of open quantum systems, for example, those that can be put in Lindblad form, uh, where this H would be called the Louisvillian super operator, and this vector would actually be the uh, n squared elements of a density matrix. This could also be uh, any linear dynamical system, any factory churning out widgets, any population dynamics of goats and things that eat goats. In there. Uh, resulting dynamics as long as it's linear. Um, so even though this equation appears in lots of different settings, there are some qualitative features that this equation has um, that depend on the specific form of H. And depending on the physics that we're modeling, we may think of constraining H to have some uh, specific symmetries or some specific properties. Just to be very specific, in the case of popular application number one, which is the quantum mechanics of closed system, it's usually taken as a postulate of quantum mechanics that this matrix is going to be Hermitian. And if that's the case, and that's certainly the context in which I learned most of my linear algebra, um, there are some very nice familiar results that we can immediately cite. We know that the eigenvectors of this matrix are going to be orthogonal, its eigenvalues are going to be rare. Um, if I imagine varying this matrix as a function of some parameter, the eigenvalues are going to vary in a way that's always analytic. And these are just direct statements, not even about this equation, but just about Hermitian matrices. Once I start to think, well, okay, what's the time evolution? What are the phenomena described by this equation? Then there's some immediate generic results that we all learn in first year uh, quantum mechanics, maybe in graduate school, maybe in undergrad that aren't like related to specific physical systems like a hydrogen atom or a degenerate electron gas, but are just sort of generic mathematical properties of this equation. And these are results like that there's an adiabatic theorem. If I vary H very slowly, there's certain nice things that happen. Um, if I keep track of the evolution of the state vector as I vary the Hamiltonian slowly, there's nice uh, geometric phases. If I go a little too fast, I can appeal to the Landau-Zener results. If I make this Hamiltonian matrix oscillate as a function of time, I have Fermi's golden rule and the like. They're just a very nice uh, family of very generic results. And just to be clear, uh, well, yeah, let me just stop there. This is the system we're talking about. Um, there's another situation in which we might take H to be Hermitian, which is where we regard this equation as a nicely rewritten version of F equals MA. Uh, describing classical masses and springs, describing a system like that. If this is the physical system that we're after, this is exactly the equation of motion that we will write down. And so without even thinking about it, I can just immediately import every one of these results into my description of this classical oscillator system. Um, the eigenvectors, which we call normal modes, are orthogonal. The eigenvalues, which we would call the normal mode frequencies, are real. All these uh, phenomena hold. It's sometimes a bit surprising to people to realize that these generic results also hold. Um, 
there is an adiabatic theorem for classical oscillators, which means if I have a system of springs and masses and I excite some normal mode, and then I slowly vary the masses and springs, the energy will stay in the normal mode that's smoothly connected with the original. Likely, likewise, there's a Berry's phase, there's Landau Zener tunneling, there's Fermi's golden rule in all the same settings. Okay, formally, I would say um, there's an isomorphism between these physical systems, uh, which means that any true sentence, any true sentence uh, statement involving these quantities interpreted in this way will also be true of this system when I reinterpret those quantities in this way. And so it can be kind of fun to think about your favorite quantum mechanical effect and to think about what its analog is when just re-expressed using this language. Um, and that is not the topic of my talk today. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, topic. It's a nice way of building some intuition, but that's not what I'm gonna be talking about today. What I'm gonna be talking about today is the fact that when we talk about classical oscillators, um, you may constrain the dynamical matrix H to be Hermitian, but you don't have to. It's perfectly natural within the language of F equals MA and classical mechanics to allow this uh, dynamical matrix to be any complex matrix. So let me just explain to you how that might work. If you build this matrix out of just masses and springs, or if you prefer the electrical domain capacitors and inductors, your uh, time evolution will certainly be generated by a Hermitian uh, matrix. But in F equals MA Newtonian physics, we have other elements at our disposal. And in particular, if I add uh, linear viscous damping, a resistor, if you will, and uh, a non-reciprocal element, which in the case of classical mechanics would be provided by a, a rotating frame of reference, um, then between these, I can build up any linear network, which is to say any realization of this equation of motion in which the matrix here is any complex matrix, okay? Uh, and it would be very steampunk to spend our time like buying these little elements from the shop and soldering them together in order to realize these arbitrary tunable systems. That's not really what we do, but I just, if you prefer a mechanistic picture of what is an arbitrary complex uh, generator of time evolution, you can build it in this way. In practice, we find it a little more convenient uh, to make use of a different approach for controlling the dynamical matrix of a system of oscillators that I, I'll say more about later, but I'll just quickly illustrate here so we have a concrete frame of reference. Suppose that my two uh, oscillators of interest are the two modes of vibration of oscillation of the spherical pendulum, and that's certainly a Hermitian uh, setup. But if I take uh, my modes of interest and couple them via a weak nonlinearity to some auxiliary modes, as illustrated here by an optical cavity, and I drive those auxiliary modes, then at least in a broad class of, uh, of limits, the drive that I apply to these auxiliary modes can just be integrated out and converted into um, the matrix elements of an effective uh, time evolution operator for this harmonic system. This is a very well-established technique and it's the one that we'll end up using. But just so you don't imagine that we really have to have these rotating shafts and literal dash pots and everything. And so once uh, you start to think about the equation of motion, this is now really a very broad class of systems that I'm talking about. This is literally any classical system close to an equilibrium. Um, once you start, once you, uh, start thinking about the equation of motion that describes such a system in which time is generated by an arbitrary complex matrix, there are some qualitatively new features that, uh, that emerge. The eigenvalues are not in general gonna be real. The eigenvectors are not gonna be orthogonal. The degeneracies become less rare. Uh, there's no adiabatic theorem. And, but really what I wanna talk about today is kind of most directly a consequence of the fact that if I ask how the eigenvalues depend on the parameters that appear inside this matrix, that dependence has some strange features. Um, it's not always Taylor expandable. And really what I wanna focus on is that in this dependence, if I just plot the eigenvalues as a function of the parameters that appear in the matrix, there appears to be some obvious topological structures uh, in that spectrum. And this is a topological structure that's completely absent in the Hermitian case and these kinds of topological structures have generated a lot of interest lately. 
Um, so that's what I want to explore in this talk. And let me just pause here and say, um, is there somebody who's motivating and seeing if they're raised hands? Because I'm uh, perfectly happy to pause and take questions in the course of things. And I can only see a few people at a time. Is there anyone here, unless there's anyone online? Uh, anyone online can just uh, enter questions in the chat or unmute okay. and ask. So I will not be monitoring the chat, but I think if you click raise hand, I'll see that in my little gallery. Um, and I'm very happy to, to be interrupted that way. Please go ahead. Okay, so really what we're interested in is uh, understanding a sort of interesting structure that people have noticed in the way that eigenvalues depend on the uh, parameters and matrices. So let me give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. Suppose I have a two by two matrix, just that's it, a two by two matrix in which there are two parameters that I'm gonna vary. Maybe they're two of the matrix elements or they appear somehow in there. I'll call those phi one and phi two. So when I pick a certain value for these two uh, control parameters, that picks a certain matrix. And that matrix has two eigenvalues. Here they are represented in the complex plane. Now, if I start to vary those control parameters, let's say I, I vary them smoothly along a path in this control space, that will cause the eigenvalues to also vary smoothly in general, as long as we don't hit a degeneracy, they'll still vary smoothly. And so that smooth evolution of the eigenvalue spectrum is traced out here. If I go a little further and imagine that I'm gonna vary these control parameters in a closed loop in this space, something interesting happens. I start with a certain spectrum. I'm gonna end up with the same spectrum. Um, and there's gonna be some smooth evolution that connects the initial spectrum to the exact same spectrum at the end. And if I change that path a little bit here in control space, I'll change just a little bit the path that the eigenvalues trace out here. But if I change that path a lot, some dramatic things can happen. So if I change the path sufficiently, I can get a situation in which these two strands really change qualitatively and the smooth evolution of each eigenvalue doesn't map back to itself, but really manifests what I would call a swap here. And whether or not we get eigenvalues mapped to themselves or whether they seem to swap is contingent on whether this control loop encloses a certain point in this space. And that's the point where the matrix becomes degenerate. It's what's known as an, as an exceptional point. And so this is the topology that I'm talking about. Depending on some topological feature of how I vary my control parameters, the topological features uh, evident in the way the eigenvalues evolve seem to change. And so that's what we would like to have a somewhat better understanding. And I should emphasize at this point, if uh, we only want to talk about this story, the two by two case. This is very well understood. And we, I don't think I have anything to add to the, what's known about this story here. It's really just sort of a consequence of the square root function. Um, but it's less well understood sort of how to translate a nice, clear visual picture like this uh, to the case when we're talking about bigger matrices, three by three, four by four. For example, if I have a four by four case, um, is the corresponding story that I should hunt for the fourfold degeneracy and then try to draw a control loop around that and then my four eigenvalues will permute? Is it even permutations that we should be talking about? Are there any like qualitatively new features that might emerge as a result of considering the case of n greater than two? And really in a bigger picture, what is the general structure that I'm talking about here? Like this should, this should be some pretty well-known mathematics. Like we're just talking about eigenvalues of small matrices, right? This should not be anything terribly exotic. Um, so that's the, these are the questions for my talk. And while they're motivated by the ubiquity of that equation of motion I started with, we're not even gonna talk about solutions to that equation of motion. That's way ahead of where I'm gonna get to. Everything that I'm talking about here and that I'll be talking about in, my, in this talk um, is just related to the properties of complex matrices and their eigenvalues. Why do their spectra show this kind of topological dependence on the parameters that determine the matrices. Okay, so since we're gonna be talking about generic properties of complex matrices, let's just start by getting a sense of the landscape that they define in which they live. If I'm willing to talk about any complex two by two matrix, um, in order to specify it, I have to give you four complex numbers. That's eight real numbers. The order of those eight numbers really matters and we sort of have a sense of which matrices are close to each other. And that's enough information to define the topological space of complex two by two matrices, which for all practical purposes is just eight dimensional Euclidean space. You give me eight real numbers, 
I can tell you which complex matrix you're talking about. It's not a very exotic space. In the physics that we talk about, the trace of the matrix never matters. So let me just remove the trace. And at that point, I just have three independent complex numbers. So I'm talking about a six dimensional space. And there's a nice way to parametrize these in terms of the, our familiar Pauli matrices. And that's just with one uh, three vector. That's our usual magnetic field that we would use to describe a Hermitian two by two matrix. And then I can get the rest of these complex entries by having another three vector uh, multiplied by I that gives me the complex, the non-Hermitian part of this matrix. Okay, you don't have to think about it this way, but it's a nice way to think about it. Two, three vectors certainly account for six dimensional Euclidean space. And throughout this talk, I'm gonna try and draw pictures of everything that I talk about, okay? Because I think it's nice to be able to visualize things. So here's my best effort to draw six dimensional Euclidean space. I can't do a great job, but just sort of imagine here it is. Every point in this space is some traceless two by two matrix. And now let me start to ask, well, okay, that's not a very interesting space. What are the interesting subspaces? What are the interesting important subsets? Let's start with the Hermitian matrices. Um, the Hermitian matrices are just all those matrices for which there's no imaginary magnetic field and you just specify your Hamiltonian with some real magnetic field, which is to say it's just three dimensional Euclidean space. This is familiar results. This is just saying, you tell me where the magnetic field is, we've got a two by two Hermitian Hamiltonian. So this space is not particularly interesting in and of itself and it's embedding in the larger space is also not particularly interesting, it's just a, a flat slice. Uh, let me go to the next candidate for some just big famous subset of matrices, like of these Hermitian matrices, which ones are degenerate? Well, I can only get a degenerate one by setting this magnetic field to zero. That's the only time my levels come together. There's literally only one matrix that does that. It's the zero matrix. Here it is, it's just one point in that space. So far, no very interesting structure. But now let me say, okay, let me ask about Hermit, about degenerate matrices generally, not necessarily Hermitian. I have a degenerate traceless matrix if and only if the two eigenvalues are equal to each other. At that point, we're talking about degenerate matrices. This is one complex constraint. So if you like, it's two real constraints. So out of my big six dimensional space, um, this is going to be a four dimensional subspace. There are only two constraints on it. So the first takeaway is there are a lot of these. There are more uh, non-degenerate, non-Hermitian degenerate matrices than there are Hermitian matrices altogether. The second point is that uh, I can actually tell you what these two constraints are in terms of these funny magnetic fields. They require that these two three vectors uh, be equal in magnitude and be perpendicular to each other. And as long as I satisfy these two constraints, I've got uh, degeneracy. And so what that tells you is I'm free to pick any size of this magnetic field that I want. Um, and then any orientation of this L-shaped object in three dimensions. And that tells me that this space has some interesting structure. There's one sort of uninteresting dimension. And then there's uh, three dimensions which are wrapped up uh, in a manner uh, that represents the orientation of an object in three dimensions, which is the three-dimensional real projective space. Okay. So if I try to draw that, what I have is that the degenerate matrices have uh, some uninteresting dimension, which I've illustrated here, but at every point, if you're not familiar with RP3, you can think of it as a solid three-dimensional ball where you're free to move around, but every time you move uh, to the edge, you reappear at the antipodal point. So it's this topologically non-trivial space, okay? So that's what the degenerate subspace of two by two matrices look like. And uh, with the exception of this one zero matrix here, these are all what are known as exceptional points. If I try to bring them to Jordan normal form, they will look like a Jordan block. That's sort of the best I can do in terms of diagonalizing them. And uh, so the takeaways here uh, are that there are a few surprises. Uh, exceptional points are more numerous, numerous than all the Hermitians. The space of these degenerate matrices is just by itself has this weird wrapped up uh, topology. In collaboration with Nick Reed and, and Judith, really they did the hard work. Uh, they calculated uh, some interesting features of adiabatic transport in this degenerate space. It has some nice properties. Uh, you can read about it here. And the last thing that I want to mention is, you know, if you want to explore this space, you need six linearly independent tunable parameters in your 
two by in your two coupled harmonic oscillators. And we've demonstrated that experimentally using cavity optomechanics. So this isn't just sort of uh, theory land. This is the kind of thing that we can really do in the lab. Um, but again, this is actually not what I want to talk about. This is a foretaste. This is maybe establishing some language and some pictures for talking about complex matrices in general. But I'm going to focus on a small segment of this story. And it's the segment that says, look, suppose I don't want to control the entire matrix. Suppose all that I care about is its eigenvalue spectrum. And we do this a lot, right? In quantum mechanics, if I have a spin one half and I really want to specify it's Hamiltonian, I have to give you a vector magnetic field. But there's a lot of interesting physics you can do just by tuning its splitting, right? And that's why some of us put spin one half systems inside of solenoids and just apply one real number to the solenoid, which is the current in it, because that's enough to set its spectrum if that's all you care about. And likewise, uh, for these non-Hermitian, uh, for these complex matrices, the spectrum is going to be n complex numbers. We are always throwing away the trace, so it's n minus one. So in order to set, uh, in order to pick such a, uh, a spectrum, I'm going to need two n minus one dimensions, two n minus one real numbers to specify n minus one complex numbers. And so somehow within the n squared entries of the matrix, um, I only need to worry about a small subset of them, so to speak, if I want to specify the spectrum. And a nice way of thinking about that is just thinking about the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of the matrix. Right? If you give me a matrix and I want to find the eigenvalues, I just calculate its characteristic polynomial and go looking for the roots of it. And that's nice because those uh, coefficients of that polynomial are very simple functions of the matrix elements themselves. You can just write them down right away. And this is a little bit more involved, but it turns out they also give a smooth parameterization of the space transverse to this exceptional point space. So again, here's this cartoon of two by two matrices, all the degeneracies, the exceptional points live on some sort of extended four dimensional space. But if all I'm interested in is the spectrum, um, a degenerate matrix is just one point, and then I can perturb that spectrum in two ways. Uh, two linearly independent ways. And you can get that just uh, from here, the two n minus one uh, uh, linearly independent ways to control the spectrum of a complex two by two matrix. There are two of them, or uh, roughly speaking, once you have said, I don't want to move along within this family of degenerate matrices, I just want to go to new spectra, I have to move transverse to this space here. So this is the kind of thing that we're going to be talking about. And again, just another way of saying it is that in the characteristic polynomial of a two by two traceless matrix, there's just one complex parameter. And so let me define my controls to be its real part and its imaginary part. And so this is why, if you like, in the two by two case, once you have a plane and you can move around in the plane, you're kind of doing everything you can do with the, um, oops, yeah, with the two by two case. So let's move on now to the three by three case. Um, in the three by three case, I can tell you the same story. It's a 16 dimensional uh, space. The degenerate matrices form a 12 dimensional subspace. So right off the bat, that tells you there are four dimensions left. And you can see that just by writing down the characteristic polynomial of such a matrix. There are two complex coefficients. So I need four numbers to control. So if all I care about is the spectrum of eigenvalues, I can just pick one spectrum that's really triply degenerate, and then I can perturb it in four linearly independent ways. So I need to explore a four-dimensional space around it. Um, and this is the first indication that there's going to be something really pretty different about three by three or four by four, et cetera, uh, situations, because here, my triple degeneracy is just a point in four dimensional space. And there's no meaning of the concept of enclosing a point in four dimensions. There's no meaning of enclosing a point in three dimensions. And circling is an operation of co-dimension two. So it makes perfect sense here to talk about, well, does my loop wind around the exceptional point or not? Here, I can't say that. So we're gonna have to be talking about something else. In addition, um, there's only one triple degeneracy in this space, but there may be a whole manifold, a whole family of doubly degenerate matrices. In general, I'm gonna lift the 
degeneracy fully, but there might be some perturbations that leave a, a twofold degeneracy. So somehow we're going to have to sort out how the story is really going to play out. And that's what I'm going to be telling you about today. That's the main point of my talk. Um, this would be a reasonable place to pause and just ask if there are questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so if we go to four by four, it's going to get worse and harder to visualize. So let me give you a nice way of visualizing any case, n by n. Okay. So you have a complex n by n matrix, 27 by 27, whatever you want. There is a control space for its spectrum, which will be 52 dimensions or something like that, some high dimensional space. But in that space, you pick a point, you've picked a matrix, and that matrix will have n complex eigenvalues. So here's a drawing. One point in control space corresponds to one complex spectrum with n eigenvalues in the complex plane. In this case, n seems to be four, but that's just illustrative. And now let me imagine in the control space varying this point along any closed path that I want in any uh, dimension. And I'm not really going to do this as a function of real time, but just parametrically move it around. If I do that, at the end of the loop, the only thing I know is I definitely have the same spectrum because I come back to exactly the same matrix. It has to have the same spectrum. But now let me ask how these eigenvalues smoothly evolve during the time that I'm smoothly evolving the Hamiltonian. And let me just draw you one possible example for how they might evolve. This is a perfectly legitimate evolution. The spectrum is the same at the beginning, at the end, but you can see that the evolution doesn't have to map each eigenvalue smoothly back to itself. Okay, so this is the first clue of what we're really talking about in general here. Um, this object is what's called a braid. And if you haven't encountered them before, they're formal definitions, but loosely speaking, it's just the path you get by taking a set of endpoints in the plane and mapping it back to itself, possibly with permutations. Okay. Um, it's, it's this smooth process here. Let me now consider uh, another path though, which has the same starting and stopping point. So it's gonna have the same initial spectrum and the same, fall, uh, same final spectrum, but I'm gonna uh, just do a different loop. And if I do that, the eigenvalues, again, will smoothly evolve back to the same set, but they might do that smooth evolution in a different way. And you can see that this object over here is topologically distinct from this braid here. They are two topologically different braids. Okay. And that's a little surprising because if you think about what determined them, it was just these loops over here. And those loops don't look topologically distinct. I can smoothly deform this red loop into this blue loop. But somehow that will in, uh, involve smoothly deforming this red braid into a blue braid. So let's see what's really happening when I imagine doing such a, such a violent thing. So to do that, I'm going to animate the red braid as I smoothly deform it into the blue braid. And you can see that in order to do that, I have to force two of these strands to pass through each other. That's what turns one kind of braid into another kind of braid. Okay. And so what does that correspond to over here in control parameter space? Well, it corresponds to smoothly deforming the red loop into the blue loop, but something dramatic must have happened when I pushed two braids through each other and changed the braid topology. And the answer is, well, pushing two braids through each other means that at some point, two eigenvalues had to become equal. That's what it means for two of these braids to cross. So what really distinguishes uh, the original red braid from the, from the blue braid is that they, uh, in order to push one into the other, I had to push it through an exceptional point. And this now gives a clearer picture still of what we're talking about. So not only does a loop in control space produce a braid of eigenvalues, a loop that produces a specific kind of braid can't be deformed into a loop that produces a topologically distinct braid unless you push that loop through an exceptional point in the control space. Another way of saying this is if you give me a loop, the specific kind of braid that it produces is determined by how that loop encircles exceptional points. Because if I say I have a loop and I can't turn it into some other loop, that's because I can't push it through something in that space. And that something via this argument here is the exceptional points. Okay, so at this point, uh, I can just tell you this now kind of clarifies what it is we're talking about in general and what's the well-known mathematics behind this. 
what we've bumped into is the fact that the space of nth order non-degenerate polynomials has a fundamental group of the braid group. And the fundamental group is a way of characterizing a space. It's specifically, it's a catalog for all the topologically different kinds of loops. What kinds of loops can't I smoothly deform into each other? It's that catalog together with uh, uh, a description of how those loops can be combined. Um, and this is a, a well-known result. This goes back to the sort of original definitions of braid theory by Artan a hundred years ago. Uh, so this is now, it's clear what's the well-known math we, we're talking about when we talk about complex eigenvalue spectra and how they depend on the matrices they come from. Yeah, so I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, looking at the left-hand picture there, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get this right in the number of dimensions, but that exceptional point, is it is it an isolated point or is no. it some sort of string or... It has to be a string. So uh, if I'm going to differentiate families of loops. If I'm gonna have a non-trivial fundamental group, if I'm gonna have a space in which I can't deform every loop into every other loop, I must ex excise from that space, a space of co-dimension two. Okay, so here I drew it as a point that was a cheat. It really has to be an extended object. So this uh, raises some interesting questions. The space of all spectra is topologically trivial, right? It's just Euclidean control space. Um, but the subspace of non-degenerate spectra has a fundamental group of the braid group. It's topologically non-trivial. So it's reasonable that it's complement, the only thing left in that space, which is to say the subspace of degenerate spectra is also non-trivial. Okay, so the full control space, just Euclidean space, but it has two constituent subspaces, which are both probably gonna to be topologically non-trivial. Um, so let me now try to illustrate how this looks in practice. So in the two by two case, let me retell this story. What we've learned is that in the two by two case, I control the spectrum via a two dimensional control space. Here it is, it's the plane. In that space, there's only one degeneracy, which is this one point here. So the non-degenerate space is the plane minus this point. And indeed that has fundamental group B2, which is the integers. And more familiarly, we would say this as you, you draw me a loop and that loop is characterized by an integer its winding number around this missing point. Furthermore, if I have two loops and I concatenate them, I regard them as one big loop, the total winding number of that concatenated loop is just the sum of the winding numbers of the individual loops, okay? So this recovers well-known facts about the n equals two case. And it gives us a clear picture for the first time, I think, of the three by three case. So in the three by three case, what we learned is that the control space is four dimensions. There's only one triply degenerate point in that space. Nevertheless, uh, this, uh, the space of non-degenerate matrices has to be topologically non-trivial. And the topological non-trivialness can't come from removing a point that still leaves uh, the remaining space trivial. Um, so it turns out to be pretty easy to show this. I won't do it in the interest of time, but you can at least convince yourself of this with just a few lines of algebra, that in order to get, um, uh, that the, the space of doubly degenerate points, which has to be what uh, renders the space of non-degenerate uh, matrices topologically non-trivial, has to consist of one kind of trivial dimension, which is the, turns out to be the radial distance from the EP3, producted with a trefoil knot, okay? And so what that means, at this point, you may be just take my word for it, but if you want uh, offline, I can point you to the reference that explains this very clearly. So what this means is that uh, control loops in this space are topologically non-trivial because they can intersect the trefoil knot in a variety of different ways. Here's one loop uh, interacting, uh, intersecting, uh, enclosing degeneracies in a non-trivial way. But unlike what happens over here in the two by two case, um, these braids aren't characterized just by an integer. Uh, these loops aren't just characterized by an integer. I can't just give you a winding number and that's done. Uh, it turns out that uh, concatenating these loops is non-commutative. And in general, if I go to four by four or five by five, I can't draw you a nice picture, but all of these features still hold. In all these higher cases, the space of exceptional points is non-trivial, like it's something like a knot. Um, 
the non-degenerate spaces uh, have their fundamental group uh, as braid groups. That's a non-abelian group, which is to say that if you have n greater than two, control loops don't commute. Their winding numbers don't just add, they respect some more complicated algebra. Okay, so this is some uh, pretty helpful generic insights into what we're talking about when we talk about going around exceptional points in three by three and higher cases. And that's the end of the theory talk. So this is kind of our insight. This is, uh, I could just end the talk here. Um, I, I hope this is like sort of a, a helpful pedagogical way of visualizing this story. Um, but for the rest of the talk, I'll just describe some experiments and we should actually try to visualize this. In the three by three case, and this is a pretty, you know, picturable story that we thought it would be nice to uh, just take some pictures of it. This mathematics is not in, you know, dispute or anything like that. I just thought we'd like to go and measure this just to make sure it's always good to check. So experimentally, we're gonna realize this by having an N equals three system, a system of three modes, three coupled classical oscillators. In our case, they're gonna be three normal modes of a thin sheet of silicon nitride. That's all they are, just these three mechanical modes. You could build this with three pendulums if you wanted, or whatever your favorite system is. Um, we're gonna control these th modes three by three dynamical matrix by putting this membrane inside of an optical cavity and filling that cavity with light. And this is this sort of funny, uh, I meant to have a cartoon for this. This is this sort of uh, cartoon that I showed you way back when, when I said a nice way of really tuning uh, the dynamical matrix of a bunch of oscillators is coupling with some parametric modes like an optical cavity. That's what we have here. So when we drive this optical cavity with uh, three laser tones, it turns out that those three laser tones powers, the three powers, and then their common detuning, we're just gonna vary their frequencies all together with respect to the optical cavity resonance. This gives us four linearly independent parameters. That's all we need to explore the spectra of this three, three mode system. Um, for the optomechanics connoisseurs in the audience, um, the fact that we use three lasers introduces some beat notes in the cavity. Really what's happening is these uh, mechanical modes are very non-degenerate. We can't access any kind of degeneracy. Um, when we put in the three lasers, um, each laser is sort of pretty good at tuning one of the modes, but that's it. Um, and then really what happens is these lasers introduce a beat note inside the cavity. So that if you like in a rotating frame or in a floquet picture, these guys' quasi-frequencies become nearly degenerate. And so technically what we're doing is gonna be, if you like in a rotating frame, or it's gonna be looking at uh, triple degeneracies of quasi floquet quasi-modes, but the math is, and physics are all the same. Uh, and the other point I should make is this is a system we really understand. We know what the microscopic Hamiltonian is. So I don't have to appeal to algebraic geometry or anything to calculate anything, I can just, plug in, you know, write down the Hamiltonian and calculate its eigenvalues in terms of the microscopic parameters that we understand really well. So we're gonna be able to check our generic theory against the specific predictions of this microscopic model. And just to be clear, the membrane is a real thing. It looks like this, it's one square millimeter, gets mounted in a little holder, which gets put inside of a high finesse optical cavity. That optical cavity gets put inside of a cryostat, and lots of laser beams get sent in. But again, the laser beams jobs are just to tune the dynamical matrix of the mechanical modes of this membrane. So the way we do this in practice is we pick some laser tunings and some laser powers, send those into the cavity, and then we tickle the membrane with another laser and measure its response to that tickle. We just do spectroscopy on the mechanical modes. And if we sweep around this frequency, we see a resonance. If we sweep around this frequency, we see a funny resonance. If we sweep around this frequency, we see a funny resonance. And what's going on here is that when you drive the system at this frequency, this mode responds, but because of all the beat notes in the system, this mode's motion effectively drives this motion on resonance. This is the rotating frame story. And so there's sort of always three coupled modes. You can just write down the equations of motion, solve them. Um, and so you can fit this data uh, really to nine Lorentzians, but they're very constrained. They're only three independent eigenvalues. So this black line is a fit, simultaneous fit to all this data. It spits out our three eigenvalues. You can think of these as the frequencies and line widths of each resonance. And then from the amplitudes of these uh, 
Lorentzians, we also get some information about the eigenvectors themselves. We can't fully reconstruct them, but we get enough information to make use of them later on. But for now, basically we just take driven spectra, we fit them to extract the eigenvalues, and then we move on. Um, if you like, we move on by changing the uh, laser's parameters, and that will give us a new bunch of uh, spectra. So our first job here is to make sure that with these tuning parameters, we can really access a triple degeneracy, okay? So that's hard to visualize because there are four tuning parameters and it's just hard to see. So what we're gonna do is in this four dimensional control space, we're just gonna vary two parameters in a slice that we think is maybe gonna intersect the triple exceptional point. And then we're gonna vary two other parameters and then we're gonna vary two other parameters and then actually keep doing this through all the choices. Um, and if we do that, if we take these say three slices here, where we're just varying different combinations of the powers, and at each point in these uh, planes, we, met, we measure the eigenvalues. And at each point, we just convert this to a metric that says, hey, how close are your eigenvalues to having collapsed to degeneracy? So this is just a nice quantity that vanishes at the triple exceptional point. Here it is plotted on those planes. And then we sort of, just for visualization purposes, stitch those planes together in real three-dimensional space. And because the actual space is four dimensions, there are four different ways of doing this depending on which parameter you're keeping fixed. Here's what it looks like. Uh, an EP3, again, would be a minimum in this color scale. We have a microscopic model for this system, so we can just calculate all these things a priori, and it agrees pretty nicely with the, with the theory. So from this, we infer that an EP3 is located here. And the meaning of this is uh, totally irrelevant uh, because all we wanna know is that we've located EP3, because then what we wanna do is measure the eigenvalue spectrum on a surface surrounding that to try and see this trefoil knot. This is sort of the intriguing uh, prediction that we're interested in, right? That way back here that, uh, yeah, there's a point of EP3, that's great, but around it, it's surrounded by trefoil knots, so to speak, of double degeneracies. So having located EP3, let's now measure the spectrum on some surface surrounding it and check if we see trefoil knots. And again, this is a little hard because we have to surround uh, EP3 in four dimensions. So we're looking at the surface of a hypercube. And the surface of a hypercube, you can maybe convince yourself, is made out of eight three-dimensional cubes. And this is reassuring, but it's still hard to visualize. So in order to show you how we take our data, let me just start back in flatland and make a nice analogy with a familiar system. Suppose I had to take data on the surface of a three-dimensional cube and explain it to a flatlander. Well, I have all that data lives on six squares. So I can just unfold the cube into what's called its net. Uh, and that's nice. Locally, there's no deformation of any face, but it won't preserve topology in any obvious way. I really have to remember that somehow I'm supposed to stitch these squares back together to understand the surface. So there's another way of visualizing it though, which is to uh, project that square down into flatland stereographically. So I take one face and I map it to a little square here. And then I take the four faces around it and map it to these trapezoids. And then the last face has to get kind of stretched out to infinity, which is ugly, but this is a mapping that preserves topological structures in the original surface, or nearly always does. And I can do exactly that with the hypercube. I can regard it as its net. It's just its assembly of these eight cubes and just remind you that you're supposed to stitch them together in a way that's impossible to embed in three dimensions. But it's also nice to take each one of these cubes and just map it to a three-dimensional region. In this case, I'd take one of the cubes and map it to a center cube here. The six cubes that touch it and map it to these sort of trapezoidal solids. And then the last cube has to get deformed out to infinity, which is ugly, but it turns out there's no interesting data in that cube, so it's kind of nice. So this is the visualization that I'll actually use. And it's nice because each cube where we really raster real experimental parameters is at least linearly mapped to one of these regions here. So you can really kind of put experimental axes on it. And this is the projection that I'm gonna describe to you. Um, so in principle, we could just raster densely all over this cube and I could just take every point that looks like a double degeneracy and color it and a trefoil knot should appear. That's just too hard for us um, in practice. So what we found it easier to do was just to pick a slice, a two-dimensional slice in this space. And on every point in this slice or in every pixel, 
measure a mechanical spectrum. From that spectrum's eigenvalue, extract two quantities. One is just the discriminant of the eigenvalues. This is a quantity that vanishes at any degeneracy and has a two pi phase winding around it. And the other is a quantity that we extract from those amplitudes of these Lorentzian that's related to the eigenvectors. Technically, it gives us the solid angle they subtend. So when it vanishes, that tells you that eigenvectors have collapsed. And it also has a two pi phase winding. So here is a typical 2D slice of this, where at every point we've collected mechanical spectra and we've calculated the discriminant, its magnitude here, it has a minimum, its argument, it looks like it has a vortex here. And then the same thing for this thing we call the eigenvector indicator. And within this space, there does seem to be a double degeneracy. And so um, I could just tell you this is an EP2, but we wanted to be a little bit more algorithmic. So what we did is we applied some modest outlier rejection and smoothing to each of these data points, and then used image recognition techniques to locate minima and phase windings. And so here's the algorithmically located double degeneracy found in four not quite independent ways. And that allows us to say, hey, there's a double degeneracy at this point. And then we do this again and again and again for 61 different planes as it happens. In each one, we turn these algorithms loose and let it identify uh, points of double degeneracy. And then we stitch them together. Again, we have a microscopic model of the system. We can just calculate kind of what this should look like and it agrees very well with the microscopic model. So running this uh, now leaves us with the following data set. So what I'm showing here as points are all the locations where we have identified a double degeneracy within this uh, three-dimensional hypersurface surrounding an EP3, okay? And here it is uh, shown in this kind of nice rectilinear stereographic projection. Here it is in the sort of usual stereographic projection. Um, there's one more quantity that we can use to help visualize uh, these guys, which is that uh, every time you have a double degeneracy, uh, there's a nice quantity, again, related to the eigenvalues that sort of serves as a coordinate along uh, the knot. And that sort of helps to clarify what the knot structure is. We call it theta. Again, here it is in one projection. Here it is in the other. Okay. So this is the picture of where the double degeneracies live in the vicinity of a triple degeneracy. They live on this trefoil knot. The other point and sort of where we started was that um, if I have this trefoil knot, if I now know where my double degeneracies are, then what I said is that if you imagine varying a Hamiltonian in some loop, then you should see the eigenvalue spectrum braid in a manner that's determined by how this loop encloses these exceptional points. So again, we do this not in real time or anything. I just go back through the massive reams of data that we took and just plot the eigenvalue spectrum literally as a function of points in the data set that we acquired. And for a loop that doesn't actually enclose the trefoil knot, we see a braid. This is what the eigenvalues do. It's a trivial braid. Just every eigenvalue comes back to itself. But if I instead pick a loop that actually does enclose the degenerate subspace, this one here, you can see that the braid is non-trivial. The eigenvalue spectrum maps smoothly back on itself, but not via the identity. And if I pick a more complicated loop through our data set, uh, this one is topologically distinct from this one, it's a different braid. And specifically, these three braids that I've shown you here are the identity, sigma one, and the product of sigma one and sigma two, which are enough to generate the entire braid group B3. So any braid you want, I can build by concatenating these two loops together. So this is now a picture of that structure that I was showing you way back when. This is the eigenvalue braids, and this is the specific braid being determined by the topological manner in which the control loop encloses the degenerate subspace. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Um, just as some quick conclusions here. Um, what I presented you with is not new math at all. This is definitely very well-known math, but I think it's sort of the realization that there's a nice um, application of this math in a well-posed physical question. And the well-posed physical question has been, when I make a control loop of non-Hermitian systems, how do, what happens to my eigenvalues? And the formal uh, statement here would be that every homotopy class of loops, all the topologically equivalent loops, uh, generate the same kind of braid, an isotopy class of braids. 
but here's how I would say it in sort of more conventional language. Again, this is well-known math. This is sort of century old uh, result. It reproduces everything we know and love about the n equals two case, but it, it explains to us qualitatively new features that aren't present in the n equals two case and that I would not have guessed, but which are generic for n greater than two. And that's first of all, that control loops don't commute and that the space of degeneracies is, has some non-trivial structure in the n equals three cases and not. And the very last point that I would make in sort of uh, my talk itself is that this is not some exotica of cavity optomechanics or like fine tuning this or that. This is the exact opposite. This is the generic structure of any complex matrix, any physical scenario in which you should be considering all complex matrices like generic uh, linear dynamical systems. This is the generic structure of, of their spectrum. Okay, so in terms of next steps, um, let me admit that I have now told you nothing about physics, so to speak, nothing about time evolution of a physical system. Everything I've just told you is about complex matrices. So what about the state vector? What about the state of the system and its time evolution? Is there any interesting consequence of these cool structures? I mean, it's a nice picture, but because there's something we can do with real time evolution. Um, the answer is I don't really know. Uh, I think it's a bit of an open question. If anybody has input on this, I would love to hear ideas. A wonderful thing that you might imagine is I consider two loops here, a blue loop and a red loop. In terms of just parametric evolution, eigenvalues would evolve like this. But what's the real physical evolution of the system? Would it be the case that if I prepared the state vector in this state, and then in real time executed the blue loop, that my physical system would be transported to this state? And if I instead executed the red loop, that it would be transported instead to this state? That would be so cool. This would be um, an operation where the final, same initial state and the final state is only determined by the topology of the control sequence. That would be really nice, really useful. Um, that is not simple to do because for non-Hermitian systems, there's no adiabatic theorem. You aren't guaranteed, in fact, quite the opposite to stay on the smoothly connected normal mode, okay? So this doesn't work for naive adiabatic control, but it's quite possible that more sophisticated control schemes like counter adiabatic schemes uh, of the like might be able to stabilize this very elegant transport and open up a kind of a robust class of topological control schemes. So this is the kind of thing we're thinking about for the future. Um, with that, let me just conclude. This is my starting slide and thank uh, the students, Parker, Yiming, and Chitrez, and the postdoc, Yogesh, who led this experiment, and Nick and Judith, who led the theoretical work here. And thanks very much for your attention. Thank you for the audible applause. From the <laughs> yeah. All right. from that was really cool. Um, questions? Please, Jesse. Where's the mic? Can you hear me? Hi, I, I can, can hear you. Oh, great. Hey, um, really amazing stuff. Um, I have like three questions. I'll start with the hardest one <laughs> or the most. Yeah. So you said that, um, okay, yeah, these operations don't commute or, or the, the loops that you take that you take in this phase space don't commute. Mm -hmm. um, but you said that when you, you know, looked at these different braids that you could generate in the system, um, you just did it by like, you know, looking through the sheets of data you had already taken. Did you have to ensure that you, when you took those specific sheets that you swept the parameters in a very specific way? No, it's super robust. And I could, we, uh, the students have uh, thankfully generated lots of plots with like, it's not just this little loop, you know, you can take sort of, really any loop that doesn't enclose the trefoil knot or any loop that encloses the trefoil knot more or less like this. If you draw a loop that like pokes right through, you know, you can see there's some scatter on this data and I don't have a rotating version, but just to be clear, like these strands don't come anywhere near each other. There's no ambiguity about which braid this is. Um, but if you insist on taking a path that comes very close to the degeneracy, yes, the braid strands come close to each other and given finite signal to noise ratio, it might be hard for us to tell which braid it was, um, but this is very robust. And so just to be clear, you know, I said uh, what we would like to do is just densely raster through this giant space and color in all the EP2 points. 
that's sort of what we did. I mean, in practice, we did it on kind of strategically chosen slices, but not shown here is the tens of thousands of data points that aren't double degeneracies. So we have all those tens of thousands of data points in here. And so we're free to pick those, you know, pretty a lot of, and make lots of different loops out of them. And yes, this uh, braid structure is quite robust in the data. Okay, uh, I guess you, my second question was about the strategically chosen paths you took with the sheets to, to know where, oh. but I, I guess you have the model for the system. So you knew kind of where to look. Yes. Okay. Um, so you weren't, okay, cool. And then I guess my last question, maybe the simplest is just, so just to clarify the, the non-hermeticity of this system comes from the coupling of the modes, the beating or? Um, uh, it comes from the beating. It, uh, in order to get non-hermeticity, um, that's pretty generic. Once you have uh, these kinds of beat notes and you can control the relative phases of those beat notes and their frequencies, you have access to any complex dynamical matrix. So another way of saying it is like one, so just the laser tones by themselves tune each mode. There's nothing particularly non-Hermitian about that. Um, the beat notes break time uh, reversal symmetry. Having one beat note breaks time reversal symmetry, but it doesn't break reciprocity. Like a beat note's just a sine wave. You can't tell which way is forward and which way is backwards. Mm -hmm. But once I have multiple beat notes, um, that breaks reciprocity. And this is a generic way of engineering non-reciprocity into coupled mode systems via parametric drives. Um, so it's not just that we are coupling the modes, it's that we're coupling them via these beat notes and that's enough control to get non-reciprocity and everything else. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. Any questions from our online audience? Uh -huh. Peter. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for a really beautiful talk. Thank you. Hi, so Peter. You, in, uh, hi there. Uh, so early on, you sort of mentioned for any um, Hermitian matrix, there's all these things. There's Berry phase, adiabatic theorem, mm -hmm. Lando Zener transitions, uh, Fermi golden rule. And you've commented on some of them. Maybe you said that the dynam time dynamics like Berry phase may not, you don't know what to see and adiabatic theorem that doesn't exist. But I wonder if you have intuition on some of those other things, Landau's inner transitions, Fermi's golden rule. What, what to, could one expect when you uh, study these non-Hermitian? Um, I just you know, I don't know. I think there are probably other people who could answer that question more broadly than me. Um, the adiabatic theorem is really basically out the door. If you stay in the mode that always has the most gain, you'll be smoothly transported in that, and all the other modes. No, chances are against it. And really it's driven in some sense by Landau Zener tunneling uh, combined with a gain loss imbalance that kind of makes Landau Zener tunneling run away. So yeah, there's an analog of Landau Zener tunneling and it just tends to drive you into whatever mode has the most gain mm -hmm. as you might expect, right? Gain always wins in the end, it's exponential. Fermi's golden rule for like time periodic perturbations, how that story plays out in the non-Hermitian case in general, it's not. Uh, that's not my expertise. Uh, and then when I, while I have the floor, let me ask just another kind of oddball question. You know, these, you're, you made this point that this equation applies broadly in even some situation of, you know, goats eating goats and population dynamics. Uh, linear linear population, not all linear, linear population, population dynamics. dynamics. Are, are there are there interesting insights one can draw out, you know, from um, such systems into uh, I, I, is there a real world, you know, if, like places where you can think about uh, dynamics in populations having exceptional points and similar things? Yeah, let me just uh, ask if there are any uh, population biophysicists in the audience who would like to come up on that. Okay, that's sort of a joke. <laughs> um, the answer is yeah. I mean, when I, so what, I mean, at the end, when I've said, hey, you know, topologically robust control schemes, like that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and there's, uh, so like the idea that like, I want to do something to a system and I only want the outcome of that operation to depend on the grossest features of my control sequence. Like that's, that's robustness. That's a lot of people would like that. And that is what I drew a picture of here. That's not what we've realized. And in fact, it's not what we have a, 
uh, obvious clear path towards realizing, but that's what we would like to think about. Um, you know, there are systems, particularly in two mode systems where you can kind of cheat and you can almost do this adiabatic, uh, quasi adiabatic story. And we did experiments showing that other people have done experiments showing that like with two modes, it almost works. Um, and one really nice example of that, that I would just like to give a tip of the hat to is the one by uh, Shannon Wee Fan, who showed that like you could take uh, like this room scale RF uh, coupled system of the kind you might use to remotely charge your cell phone you know, from a remote charger and wander around with the cell phone. And this property would kind of stabilize the, uh, the resonance transfer of energy between these two. Yeah, so I think this is a nascent field for control theory. And uh, all that I know about it is that it's nascent. And so even like kind of what the present state of the art is, I'm not well informed about. Can I ask a question before we head out? Yeah, go for it. Um, so I think one really striking feature of the results here is, is that the robustness almost comes from the linearity. Can you comment on it? So usually when we think about control systems and either engineered or biological systems, we think about feedback and nonlinearity is actually is what endows these with robustness. Do you have any insight into like how much nonlinearity uh, you can tolerate and still have these kinds of robust features? Ever? No, that's super interesting. But so just to be clear, like you're right, this is so usually like if you want a system to settle down at like a limit cycle, you need nonlinearity to make that happen. This is because otherwise all linear systems are kind of the same. They respond to whatever drive is applied to them. This is a, a feature in at least the parameters of the system that's robust. Like what is the eigenvalues? How is that gonna depend on perturbations? There's a certain robust character here in the entire linear regime. So from very small to whenever it starts to become nonlinear. Once it becomes nonlinear, is there some like nice extension of this that I could tell you about? Well, the harmonics are gonna start to lock or something. No, I'm sure there are people who know about that, but that's again, that's just outside of my expertise. I would love to learn about it. If, if people do know about it, I would love to hear about it. Um, maybe I can ask one last question. And th this is uh, just getting at where you'd like to go with the, the dynamics. Um, I'm not even sure really how to formulate. Can, can you can you give us a picture of where you would go to, to start exploring dynamics of the system? Yeah, it's this cartoon that I drew here. So. Let's just say that, you know, instead of like tuning up the Hamiltonian, measuring the resonances, fitting it, extracting the eigenvalue, and then doing that again and again and again, and gradually building up these plots, I'd like to do some of that in real time. So and that's illustrated here. So imagine, I, I probably went through this a little bit quickly. Um, imagine that I have such a system and I actually drive this mode, the mode with this eigenvalue, up to some large amplitude. I put a lot of energy in that mode. So my two coupled springs, they're really doing this. They're not doing this. They're really in this mode. And then I turn off the drive and this excitation stays in the system. And then while it's in the system, in real time, I start to go around this loop in real time. And if there was an adiabatic theorem, which there isn't, but if there were, then I could just tell you what the time evolution of the system is. Right, it's just going to follow the smoothly connected normal mode. Whereas if what I did was to prepare that excitation in the same mode, but then go around the red loop instead, the time evolution would go like this. And so at the end of the day, the final state would either be in this state, you know, doing this, or in the, this state, doing this, conditioned on the like no subtle features, no like fine tuning, but the gross topological features. Did my loop enclose or did it not enclose? And how did it enclose the degenerate subspace? So we would really like to see something like that in, in real time. Cool. Uh, Jim. Yeah, just following up on Shankar's question, nonlinearity is often also important for forming memories. And here I kind of see this an interesting, I guess it's not a lossless system. I think loss is, some loss is always needed in forming memories. There's some arrow of time theorem there or something, but, but this seems to be encoding, it's a, it's a linear system that's encoding 
you know, a memory, a history, right? Yeah. So there must be something <laughs> you can do with that. <laughs> um, the cl- so I, I this just, I like, I, this would be a nice question for the theorists in the audience, but like the closest thing that I can think of to that is this story that I told about an excitation starts in this mode and does it end up in this mode or that one, you know, that loses all the information about the braid. That's just a statement about permutation. Let me suppose, let me hypothesize that if I track um, the phase of the oscillator, uh, so like, so for example, let me imagine this, let me imagine a really complicated braid, but at the end of the braid, every eigenvalue has been mapped back to itself. In terms of this permutation story of permuting energy, that's like doing nothing. I started with energy in such and such a mode, I ended up with it in such and such a mode. But suppose that instead I track the phase accumulated during this operation. Maybe the phase cares about which braid it got transported on. So maybe when you say memory, maybe the way the system remembers Mm -hmm. the history of its braid all the way back through space time um, would be through some analog of geometric or topological berry phase. Uh, I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know if there is a unique phase signature of the braids isotopy class, uh, but that would be an intriguing possibility. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That was really quite yeah, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. I will stop sharing and uh, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and Thanks so much. Um,